Let's turn in our Bibles now to 1 Chronicles chapter 31. Second Chronicles, please. Second Chronicles 31. We'll soon be out of Chronicles and I'll quit making that mistake. After Hezekiah had opened again the doors of the temple, had the place clean out, cleaned out and reinstituted the worship within the temple, they decided to begin again the observing of the Jewish feast. They were too late to observe the feast of the Passover. They didn't have time to go through all of the ritual uh, cleansing for it. And according to a special provision in the Mosaic Law, if they weren't able to observe it in the first month, they could observe it in the second month. And so they called for a special observance of the Passover in the second month. The people were invited to come from the northern kingdom of Israel because at this point Israel had already been uh, conquered by Assyria and were more or less captive. The, they didn't completely wipe them out as yet, but they were subject, uh, subjugated to the Assyrians already. So those that remained were invited to come down to turn again to the Lord. Some scoffed at the invitation. Others came. It was a glorious movement of God among the people. There was a tremendous spirit of revival. During the week of the Passover that they were celebrating together, it was so glorious, so wonderful. They said, let's go on for another week. And so in sort of a spontaneity, they continued the observance for the second week. And that brings us then to the beginning of chapter 31. Now, when all of this was finished, all of this, of course, was the observance of this Passover this glorious work of God's Spirit in their lives, this time of spiritual renewal, when this was finished the second week, all of Israel, those from the northern kingdom that were present, went out to the cities of Judah and they broke the images in pieces. They cut down the Azurim and they threw down the high places and the altars out of all of Judah and Benjamin in Ephraim, also in Manasseh, till they had utterly destroyed them all. Again, one of those glorious times of, of God moving upon the hearts of the people and with the renewed commitment to God, the abhorring of those things that had drawn them away from the Lord and had brought them into captivity. And so not only in Judah and in Benjamin, but on up into Ephraim and Manasseh, they were destroying the false gods, the places of the worship for the false gods. And so all of the children of Israel returned, every man to his possession, into their own cities. And Hezekiah appointed the courses of the priests and the Levites in their courses. Now, if a person were a Levite, a priest, and the difference, of course, the priest came from uh, the house of Aaron, whereas the uh, Levites were all of the uh, priesthood, the house uh, of uh, the Kohathites and the Merorites. And uh, they would serve in a two-week period out of the year. Now, they had a pretty nice job. A little better than school teachers, in fact. <laughs> in that they only had to serve in the temple two weeks out of the year. And then they would live out in the various cities that were appointed for the priest. They would live sort of regular type lives. They would farm their own fields and so forth. But two weeks out of the year, they had to uh, fulfill the priestly duties. So they would come to Jerusalem for that two weeks, sort of 
you know, like the National Guard where you've got to go two weeks and do or th for 30 days and whatever. They had the two weeks where they would come in. And when they would come to Jerusalem, then they would be given their particular duty. They'd sort of draw straws for who was to do what. And so your particular job would be designated by the lots that uh, were drawn. So they would refer to them as serving according to their course. That was the two-week specified time. And then the duty was also something that was just sort of specified by uh, the casting of lots. We remember in the New Testament, and this of course continued on into the New Testament times, Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, was ministering in the temple as was his lot, or his lot was. He was ministering according to his course, and his lot was to offer the incense before the altar of the Lord. And so uh, that was where, of course, the angel Gabriel came to him and told him that uh, his son or his wife would have a son in her old age and that he would be the forerunner of the Messiah. And so uh, they reinstituted the temple worship on a regular, ongoing basis. It had ceased under the reign of Ahaz. And so they are again telling the priest, okay, you're going to get your two weeks. And they began to set the whole thing in order, bringing the priest in for their two weeks of duty and uh, establishing the various duties according, it says, to his service. Every man according to his service, the priest and the Levites. And the service was in the offering of the burnt offerings and the peace offerings. And then to minister. And that is the word minister is to serve. And I think that we have uh, sort of made a... Uh, sad mistake in, in thinking that the term minister is something that puts people sort of above the others. In reality, it's something that puts us below the others. The word minister is that of a servant and to serve. And thus, a man shouldn't say, well, I'm a minister, you know, in a sort of a arrogant, haughty kind of uh, carry my bag tone. Uh, but... Uh, it should be, uh, you know, the other way around. I am the servant and picking up the other person's bag and carrying it for them and, and realizing that uh, God has called us to serve the Lord by serving his people. And, and that's really our task. By serving you, we serve the Lord. And God has called us as servants. And so they were to minister. And then they were to give thanks. I love this. They, they had hired a, a certain number whose duty was just to give thanks to the Lord. They would stand in the house of the Lord singing praises and giving thanks. Wouldn't that be a neat job? Just uh, to be paid for uh, giving thanks to the Lord. And just to serve Him by singing and so forth. And uh, then also to praise in the gates of the tents of the Lord. So they, they established the whole temple worship again. Uh, and he appointed also the king's substance or portion of his substance for the burnt offerings. Uh, Hezekiah became very prosperous, very wealthy. And so he, of his own substance gave the animals for the daily offerings that were to be offered unto the Lord. Back in uh, Numbers chapters 28 and 27 and 28, I guess it is, where it details the daily offerings and the monthly offerings and the new moon offerings and the, uh, the various sacrifices. And so uh, for these normal, regular, daily offerings, they were provided by Hezekiah the king himself uh, for the morning and the evening burnt offerings and for the burnt offerings for the Sabbaths, the new moons, for the set feasts as it is written in the law of the Lord. And that law of the Lord is, is Numbers 
28 and 29. I was wrong with 27. It's 28 and 29. Come to my mind. So uh, uh, you can go back and read those uh, sacrifices uh, that are referred to here uh, as they are detailed in the book of Numbers. Moreover, he commanded that the people that dwelt in Jerusalem to give the portion of the priests and the Levites that they might be encouraged in the law of the Lord. Now, there were certain of the offerings that the priest got to keep himself. When he offered the heave offering, he got to keep the offering. Uh, it was usually grain that they would offer to the Lord, but then it became the priest. And usually it was a, a tithe or a tenth of the person's crop. A person would harvest their crop, they'd bring in a tenth of the harvest. Um, and um, rather than bringing in money, they would actually bring in the grain. They'd bring in uh, the, the lambs and so forth, one-tenth of, of their increase they would give to the Lord. And this provided for the needs of the priest. And so Hezekiah encouraged them again in the giving of these offerings so that the priest would be encouraged in their work. And the people whose hearts have been touched in this spiritual renewal uh, began again to tithe of their first fruits. And uh, they, uh, as soon as the commandment came abroad, the children of Israel brought in abundance the first fruits of their corn, of their wine, of their oil, of their honey, and of all of the increase of the field, the tithe of all things, brought they in abundantly. And uh, concerning the children of Israel and Judah that dwelt in the cities of Judah, they also brought in the tithe of their oxen, the sheep, the tithe of the holy things which were consecrated unto the Lord their God, and they laid them by heaps. Uh, they were bringing in mainly the grain, the tithe of the corn and the wheat and the barley and so forth, and they would just lay them in heaps or in piles as, as you would pour your grain on the pile. It would just become a heap, a, a pile of grain. And, uh, and so they laid them by heaps, and in the third month they began to lay the foundation of the heaps, and they finished it in the seventh month. What that means, of course, the third month is the uh, month of June when they harvest the grain crops. Uh, that is when they harvested the barley. That's when they harvested the wheat. And uh, it was the beginning of the harvest season over there and still is. Uh, as you begin to harvest your uh, winter grains in the uh, month of June. So that's when they began building up these heaps of grain. And, uh, of course, on during then the summer season, the corn and so forth. So that by the seventh month, the, the, of course, in the third month, the month of June, they had the feast of the Passover, which was the feast of first fruits, bringing them unto the Lord. In the seventh month, they had the feast of the tabernacles, which was, again, uh, the, the thanksgiving time of the year. Uh, the harvest is now completed. And thus, uh, from the third month to the seventh month, the summer months, as the crops are producing, they would bring in the tithe, the tenth. And so they began to heap up. The foundation of the heaps were uh, made in the third month, in the beginning of the grain harvest. And they continued to just pile it on until the seventh month when the harvest was completed. And thus, by the end of the seventh month, there was just a tremendous uh, amount of grain and food supplies and all, enough for the supporting of the priesthood. So when Hezekiah came with the princes and they saw the heaps, they bless the Lord and his people Israel. It's always a blessing to see people respond to God. To respond with a willing heart. To, to respond in, in generosity to the things of the Lord. It's just always a blessing. And they came down and they saw all these heaps of grain and, and corn and dried fruits and all. And they, all right, Lord, 
bless those people, you know, and you just uh, spontaneously. And that is true praise, that which just spontaneously arises from your heart when you see the work of God, in the, especially in the hearts of the people. And you say, oh, Lord, that's, bless them, Lord, you know. And Hezekiah questioned with the priests and the Levites concerning the heat. What are we going to do with all this? And Azariah, the chief priest of the house of Zadok, answered him and said, Since the people began to bring the offerings into the house of the Lord, we have had enough to eat. We have plenty left over. For the Lord hath blessed his people, and that which is left is this great store here. I mean, we've got plenty, and we've got all this left over. So Hezekiah commanded that they make bins, chambers, in the house of the Lord, in which to store all of this surplus grain and all that it brought in. And, and so uh, they prepared these chambers, these little bins for the, or the large bins, I guess, for the grain and all, and they brought in the offerings and the tithes and the dedicated things faithfully. And then it tells us the names of the priests that uh, were set to take care of of this abundance and we're not going to bother with their names verse 16 and beside their genealogy of males from three years old and upward even to everyone that entereth into the house of the Lord his daily portion for the service in their charges according to their courses they have plenty to take care of all of them the little fellows from three years old who began to follow their dads on into the whole group and both the genealogy of the priests by the house of their fathers and the Levites from 20 years old and upward in their charges by their courses. So uh, the charge was the duty that they had. The course was the two weeks time. And they began that ministry actively at the age of 20. And unto the genealogy of all their little ones, their wives, their sons, their daughters, through all the congregation, for their set office they sanctified themselves in holiness. And so uh, the Levites again dedicated themselves to the task of ministry unto the Lord and unto the people. Also the sons of Aaron, the priests which were in the fields of the suburbs of their cities in every a uh, city appointed to the priest, which was called the several city, a city of refuge. The men that were expressed by name to give the portions to all of the males among the priests and to all that were reckoned by the genealogies among the Levites. And thus they were distributing the food among the priesthood. And thus did Hezekiah throughout all of Judah. He wrought that which was good and right and truth before Yahweh his God. So the record of Hezekiah, as he started his reign, he was doing that which was good, that which was right and truth before the Lord. And in every work that he began in the service of the house of God and in the law and in the commandments to seek his God, he did it with all of his heart. So we see here, first of all, the purpose of Hezekiah. was to serve the Lord in all of the work that he began in the service of the house of God, to keep the commandments of God and to seek God. That was his purpose, but he did it with all of his heart. That was his method of just going wholeheartedly for it. And the result was he prospered, always so. Put the Lord first in your life. Seek the Lord, and God will bless you. Now, after these things, uh, this, this reestablishing of the priesthood, the spiritual renewal among the people, after these things, and the establishment thereof, having established, again, this whole worship for the people, Shennacherib, the king of Assyria came, and he entered into Judah, and he encamped against the fenced cities and thought to win them for himself. Having established 
the people again in their relationship to the Lord. Then comes a testing. The Assyrians had been successful in conquering over Syria, over the northern kingdom of Israel, and over many other kingdoms. They were cruel people, they were vicious people. History records them as some of the cruelest. They would brutally mutilate those that would, they would take captive, disfiguring them deliberately. They would repopulate the people. They would take them from their homeland and separate them into small little groups in, in foreign countries, totally demoralizing them. That is why when the Lord called Jonah to go to Nineveh, which was the capital of Assyria, and call on them to repent, or God would destroy them, Jonah headed the other way. For Jonah knew that God was merciful. And Jonah was afraid that he might have a successful mission to Nineveh. He was afraid that the people hearing of the impending judgment of God, they might repent and God would not destroy them. And so Jonah decided that he was going to get out of there. He would rather die than go to Nineveh because Nineveh was a threat. Assyria was a threat to Israel and a ultimately did take Israel. So, uh, historically, we're in about the time of Jonah, the time of the Assyrian power and the call of God to Jonah to go warn them concerning the judgment of God that will come within 40 days. And of course, we know the story of Jonah, how that God intercepted him on his way to Tarsus uh, and brought him back and uh, how that he then went to Nineveh and just as he feared, the people repented in sackcloth and ashes right up to the king and, and God spared the city and Jonah went out and sat under the tree and just pouted. God said, what's wrong with you? He said, I knew you were kind and loving and gracious. I knew that. Now look, you know, you're not bringing your judgment on them. He really wanted them wiped out. And God said to Jonah, look, there are 60,000 little children in that city who are so small they don't even know their right hand from their left hand yet. Interesting to me that God's mercy really was extended because of the little kids. The heart of God for the little children, seeing those innocent little children, he, he spared the city, really, for their sake as much as anything. But um, Shinnichereb, the king of Assyria, has now targeted Judah. And he intends to destroy and bring Judah into captivity. And so he came down and he began to war against the fenced cities and thought to win them for himself. And when Hezekiah saw Shennacherib was come and he was purposed to fight against Jerusalem, he took counsel with his princes and his mighty men to stop the waters of the fountains which were without the city and they did help him. Now, basically what this is referring to is the conduit that Hezekiah built from the spring of Gihon uh, on into the pool of Siloam. The city of Jerusalem, it, of course you'd have to almost be able to visualize it in your minds and you that have been there can, uh, where the, uh, 
The hillside comes on down from the Temple Mount. It's called Ophel and the city of David. And the city in those days was down really more in the Kidron Valley. And uh, the Temple Mount was sort of the extent of the city uh, northward and uh, down into this valley, this, this uh, sort of a ridge comes on down the Tropian Valley on the right-hand side, and over here on the left-hand side you have the Kidron Valley. And this uh, ridge comes on down, and there at the bottom the Tropian and uh, Teropian and the uh, Kidron meet. Now, the walls were more or less protecting this uh, abutment that comes down, this mount that comes down, and the walls were built around it. But when the walls were built, the water supply, the spring of Gehon, which has a good supply, it's a great spring, good supply of water, it was outside of the walls. Now during the period that the Jebusites had the city of Jerusalem, they ingeniously dug a tunnel down through the rock, a shaft, and at the spring of Gihon, they diverted the waters into this cave. And uh, then at the interior of the cave was this shaft that came right on up about 100 feet or so. And it was to them like a well. They had the pool and the spring was diverted into this pool. And they would just let their buckets down like it were a well into this water. And thus they were able to supply uh, their city with water. Uh, from uh, the spring of Gihon, even though the city was under siege, within the wall of the city, they had this shaft that went on down. When David finally took, and of course because of this, the children of Israel were unable to take Jerusalem, the Jebusite city, for many, many years. Until actually the time of David, here was a alien city right within the, the middle of, of the nation of Israel, the city of the Jebusites, and they were unable to take it. But David, when he became king and came to Jerusalem, offered a special reward. The man who, uh, you know, opens the gates so that we can take the city will be my chief general. And Joab uh, went into this a cave at the spring of Gihon into the pool and then he scaled up this shaft on the inside and if you'd see it you would realize this guy really I mean it, it was a good feat because the thing is probably oh four feet wide so he'd have to you know brace his feet and and climb like a rock climber up this shaft he got into the city went out and opened the gates and all of the guys came in and they were ultimately able to take the city of the Jebusites that way now Hezekiah where the Jebusites had built this little tunnel in he began to tunnel through this whole mountainside that comes down at this point where the mountain is coming together this coming down like this it's about 1,700 feet across, laterally. And so he had a group of fellows start at the spring of Gihon, chipping through this solid rock. And he had others over at the pool of Siloam started there chipping through the rock from that side, chipping towards each other. Now remember, no jackhammers. No electrical lighting systems. Torches and candles. And these guys are down there under, these, under this massive rock. In this, in the, uh, when you go over there and when you see it, you'll wonder, how in the world did they ever do it? And when you bump your head on the rock, you realize it's hard. I mean, it's really good, solid rock that these guys chip through. And yet, 1,700 feet... They made it about, oh, 18 to 24 inches wide and an average height of about 5 feet or so so that when you walk through you have to remain sort of in a crouched position. Now, there are areas where they did get off a little bit. They started working up. And so when they realized their mistake, then of course they'd have to 
bring it on down. So there are some areas in there where the ceiling is about 12 feet high where they got off and then of course they had to they're bringing the thing on down because you, water, you know, has got to flow and the gravity flow of the water. And so uh, you can see the areas. And inside, you go inside and man, you can just imagine all kinds of, of things as they were working, uh, you know, on this project. When they got near each other, tremendous excitement because they could hear the sounds of the picks. And so then when they could hear the sounds of the other fellows with their picks, they began to come towards each other. And thus, as you're coming in the tunnel from Gaihon, you get to this right uh, angle turn, and it comes about seven feet across, and then you get the right angle again, and that's where they met. And where they met, they put this monument, which told about the digging of this tunnel. The monument was cut out and taken to the British Museum. Uh, but uh, it was a tremendous feat, engineering feat, where they diverted the spring. And of course the purpose is, why should we let them come and, and have this supply of water? And so uh, ingeniously they, they covered the spring of Gaihon so that the Assyrians wouldn't know where the water supply was. So the stopping up is actually the covering of the spring from the outside and the water then flowed on through this conduit that they made this tunnel through the rock and emptied out into the pool of Siloam so that during the siege not only would the Assyrians be kept from the water but they would have a sufficient supply of fresh water uh, to maintain themselves during the period of the siege. Part of the preparation that he made for the siege of uh, Jerusalem under the Assyrian army. So they gathered a lot of people together and they stopped up all the fountains and the brook that ran through the midst of the land, which would of course been the brook Gihon, uh, or that the came out from the uh, spring of Gihon. For he said, why should the kings of Assyria come and find a lot of water? Uh, you can imagine how much water it would take for an army of several hundred thousand. And the Assyrians did have an army of several hundred thousand. So he was going to make them work for their water. Probably the closest supply outside of the spring of Gihon was the Wadi Kelt. And uh, that is down towards Jericho. But it, you'd have to have several thousand men daily just carrying water for the tremendous army that he had. Um, we can't imagine in our days of modern conveniences, roads and trucks and buses and so forth, we can't imagine what it must have been like in those days and in moving these masses of people over land. Uh, they've got to have food supplies. They've got to carry food with them. They've got to have food preparation, sanitation. Everything. We, you just can't imagine. When you go down to Masada and you think of Masada being taken by uh, the uh, Roman legion, it was the 10th Roman legion, uh, and you see uh, how that they were out there in this dry, barren wilderness. The closest water was about 20 miles away at En Gedi. And so even to the present day, you can see the path that goes from Masada. You can stand on the top of Masada uh, on the north portico there and you can see the path going up to En Gedi where the Roman soldiers had to go to get water and all for the troops that were besieging this uh, fortress there in the middle of the wilderness. And uh, the logistics of such an operation are just mind-boggling. And so Hezekiah is doing a wise thing. He's going to make it tough on these guys. You're going to conquer us, man. You're, gonna, you're not going to do it easily. So he also strengthened himself and built up all the wall that was broken. During the reign of his father, there was an area of wall that was broken down. Uh, and uh, so he rebuilt the wall that was broken. He raised it up 
to the towers. Now, there's a little bit of ambiguity in the uh, Hebrew language there, and uh, they don't know exactly if he heightened the towers or if he brought engines of war into the towers. Uh, in the Hebrew, it's a difficult thing to uh, really translate or to know what they were saying. And so uh, here he raised it. He raised, and notice the it is in italics, so the translators added that, but and raised to the towers. Raised what to the towers? We don't know. Raised the towers? That's what most of the commentators and those who study those things believe, that he raised the height of the towers. Uh, the towers, of course, were the, the strong fortresses. Uh, the idea is get the advantage of shooting down, and you're up too high for the guys to throw their spears that high, so you have a tremendous advantage. You're shooting down or throwing your spear down at them, and they can't reach you. So build these towers. Actually, in the city of Babylon, the wall was 300 feet high, 87 feet high thick. And then it had towers that were another 150 feet higher than the wall. So you can imagine how it would be to try and take that kind of a city. You couldn't even shoot your arrows to the top of the towers. And so those guys up in those towers would have a tremendous advantage. They were sort of just you know, untouchable up there, and yet they were able to shoot down or throw the rocks down and so forth to you, but uh, they were pretty impervious to your uh, attempting to get back at them. And so uh, he raised the towers, or raised to, up to the towers, uh, and another wall he built without, and he repaired uh, Milo or Milo in the city of David. And uh, uh, that, uh, again, is, is something that you can reference with Samuel, Second Samuel 5, 9. And he made darts, arrows, spears, shields in abundance. All of this was preparation against the invasion of the Assyrians. He then set the captains of war over the people, gathered them together to him in the street of the gate of the city, and he spoke comfortable words to them or encouraging words to them. Now, as we noted this morning, he did more than pray. He was making active preparations from a physical standpoint to withstand the Assyrians. He didn't say, oh, God, deliver us from the Assyrians and leave the walls broken down and, and, and didn't make any you know, preparation at all from a physical standpoint. Always, God expects us to do certain things. There is God's work always. But there is always also the human responsibility that God requires. And being a Christian should not give you an excuse for irresponsibility. Well, I'm a Christian. I'm just going to trust the Lord to take care of my family. And I've decided to quit my job. And we're just going to live by faith. Well, faith without works is dead. I'm just going to trust the Lord to educate my kids, you know. No. There are certain responsibilities and practical things that we need to do. Christianity is very practical. You do what you have to do and you trust the Lord to take care of you. But there is that combination, always that combination. God's work, man's work. Man's responsibility. And the Bible teaches the sovereignty of God, but it also teaches the responsibility of man, the necessity of our responding to God. 
And that is an important thing to note because there are some who misread the scripture and become very careless and irresponsible and then they try to blame it on God. You know, because their family has just been evicted and they're hungry and, you know, when I was decided to just trust in the Lord and quit my job and, and just believe God to supply, why did God, you know, let us be evicted? Well, you're not using good judgment. You're not being responsible. And Christianity does not make you an irresponsible, but it does make you a very responsible person. But the whole while we realize, hey, God is my source. God is my help. God is my strength. God is going to take care of me. But he's going to take care of me by giving me the opportunity to work. For many years, over 17 years of our ministry, when we first began the ministry, and actually, uh, this is, is my 40th year. Uh, I began to pastor in Prescott, Arizona, back in um, July of 1948. So I'll be celebrating 48, 40 years in the ministry. Uh, this July uh, in the pastoring. Before that, I was an evangelist, so I'm already, uh, I was an evangelist. I sought to be an evangelist, but <laughs> I traveled around to different churches, whatever that makes you. Uh, but um, for the first 17 years, well, 19 years, I guess, or 20 years, when we first came to Calvary Chapel, I worked. Uh, in outside types of jobs to support the family needs because when we first came here we uh, were only making 150 a month from the church and that wasn't sufficient for a family of four with kids in high school and junior high and also uh, we uh, worked for the first few years uh, in outside type of employment but I looked at it as God's providing for our needs I just figured, well, it's the way God's providing, giving me an opportunity of employment in, in different types of jobs. And um, I, I think that we make a mistake when we think that God's just going to drop stuff into our lap apart from an effort on our part. God gives us the wisdom. God gives us the guidance. God gives us the abilities. He gives us the strength. And then... That's the way he provides. He provides so often. You know, I think that where we make a mistake is we are often expecting God to work in such supernatural ways that we don't recognize the work of God in very natural ways. When we were pastoring in Huntington Beach, uh, one of the jobs that he had was... Uh, of course, I was working with Alpha Beta at, at the time, but then we were also uh, working for uh, the Smith Brothers Mortuaries. My name was Smith, so I fit in real well. <laughs> and um, so Howard Smith had back problems, and he couldn't make the first calls anymore. So uh, they'd call me in the middle of the night, especially, to go out and make the first calls, go out and pick up the bodies. Uh, I got five dollars a body, and uh, <laughs> it was great. Uh, you know, the kids that need a pair of tennis shoes, and you don't have money for tennis shoes, and I get a call. I say, well, praise the Lord. The Lord provided tennis shoes for the kids, you know. Sometimes you get to pick up multiple, you know, too. You get ten bucks. A lot of interesting experiences. I remember the night we picked up Mr. Umarian. He had had a prayer meeting in his home with a group of Armenian people, beautiful people there in 
Huntington Beach, beautiful Armenian families, the Parnakians, the Amerians, and all. They had had this prayer meeting in the home. And Mr. O'Marion, after they had prayed around the circle, he was the last one. And as he said, Amen, he had a heart attack and just fell back on the floor, and that was it. I mean, he just finished his prayer up there and just, you know, just. Just right in prayer, and that was it. While he was just as he said, Amen, and he just went over on the floor. So we were called to go over there, and of course, I knew the families, and so we went in and picked him up. And as we were heading back, I said to the fellow that was with me about Mr. O'Marion, I knew the family, I knew Mr. O'Marion quite well. And I said to him, oh, that lucky stiff, he's with the Lord right now. You know. <laughs> You've got to have a humor in that job or it'll get you. So God works in very natural ways. And we need to learn to look for the supernatural in the natural. You know, well, God is leading me. Well, you know, is there some beep, 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 doo, 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 you know, and you, you think of, you know, sort of electronic types of sounds and vibrations and, and all. No, it doesn't work that way. It works in a very natural way. I was heading up to Ventura to hold a uh, meeting up there uh, on Sunday evening. Uh, and... Um, I was heading up uh, the Ventura Freeway, which wasn't a freeway at that time. And I, as I got to Sunset Boulevard, I got this, it was a beautiful day. And I had a convertible. And I thought, what a beautiful day. I, you know, don't have any real deadlines. I was going up on a Saturday. Uh, I was not going to speak until Sunday. And so I thought, hmm, I'll just drive up by Malibu. That's one of my favorite routes anyhow, is going up Malibu on a sunny day in a convertible. I mean, that's just, that's living. And uh, so I wound all the way down Sunset Boulevard to Pacific Coast Highway to go up through Malibu. And just as I pulled onto Pacific Coast Highway, there was a couple there hitchhiking. So I thought, well, I'm all by myself, beautiful day, mm, might as well give them a ride. And so I invited them into the car. They were from Montana. The kid was a farmer, came, came out to Hollywood to look for a job. I said, you'll never find any farm jobs in Hollywood, you know. <laughs> so they decided they'd head for San Francisco. I said, they don't have any farms in San Francisco, man. You need to stop along the way, Ventura, Salinas, or somewhere, you know, to get a job. And... So, um, as we were riding along, we had the opportunity of sharing the Lord with them. They both accepted Christ. We pulled over the side and they prayed, accepted the Lord. And uh, I let them off in Ventura, and the poor kids were down on their luck. And so I gave them money for a motel that night. And I took them by the church where I would be speaking the next evening. I said, hey, I'm going to be speaking here tomorrow night. Come on out to church, and uh, we'll see what the Lord will do. Well, um, it so happened that the foreman of the Del Mar Lyman Air Ranch was in church that night, sat next to these kids, started talking to them, and they did come to church. I, I, I thought, oh, I'll probably never see them again. You know, they got my bucks, and, and <laughs> they'll move on. But, uh, but they were in church the following night, and they happened to sit right next to Mr. Jenkins, who was the... Uh, a foreman at the Del Mar Lyman Air Ranch, he got to talk to him and he said, well, I can use some hands out on the ranch, you know. And so they had housing and the guy hired him right there from church. Uh, but they came forward that night to make a public profession of their faith in Christ. But I got to thinking, you know, impulse, why don't you go Coast Highway? I was already committed to the interior route. And just that crazy impulse, you think, oh, it's just my love for the beach and my love for the ocean, my love for, you know, the right up. No, it was, it was God directing. And, and you begin to see this, because God saw these two kids down there who were needing help, who were hungry, who needed to know Him. 
And, and so God just made me wind down. And while I was going down Sunset Boulevard, I began to think, oh, what am I doing? You know, these crazy signals and this long windy drive, you know. And I'm beginning to grumble until I came out to see coast. And then you see God's hand in the whole thing. All right, you know, God is, it, it's so good. But you don't think, do, 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 God's leading me, you know, Pacific Coast Highway. You know. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. And it's always a very natural way in which God works in our lives and leads us and guides us. And quite often, we're not even aware that it was God that was speaking to us until the whole thing was over. And then we look back and we say, wow, did you see that? Do you realize what just happened? You know, and then, then the, the realization, God was directing me. God was leading me. And you get then the, the, the excitement of all of realizing that God's hand was upon you after the fact so often, not during the experience. So the part that we have to play, God's part, our part. Hezekiah did his part. Now he's gathered the people together to encourage them. And so as he is encouraging them, he says, now be strong and be courageous. Don't be afraid or dismayed. Interesting encouragement, but wait a minute, Hezekiah. These guys are tough. These guys have bludgeoned the world into submission. They have a vast army. Hundreds of thousands have marched against us. You're telling us don't be afraid or dismayed? But he gives them the reason. Don't be afraid for the king of Assyria nor for all of the multitude that is with him. For there be more with us than with him. Not numerically. Because all he has is the arm of flesh. But with us is Yahweh, our God, to help us and to fight our battles. Now, God is with us to fight our battles. We've made the preparation. We've built up the walls. We've stopped up the fountains. We've appointed the captains. We have the spears and the shields and all. But our God is with us to fight our battles. And the people rested themselves upon the words of Hezekiah, the king of Judah. They, they just were comforted by his words. And after this, Shennacherib, the king of Assyria, sent his servants to Jerusalem while he was laying siege uh, to Lachish, which is down uh, in the Philistine country towards Gath. And he sent this message to Hezekiah, the king of Judah, and to all of Judah that were in Jerusalem, saying, Thus saith Shennacherib, the king of Assyria. Whereon do you trust that you abide in the siege in Jerusalem? How come you haven't fled from Jerusalem? Where is it you're just trusting? What are you trusting that you would stay there in Jerusalem, which is about ready to be besieged? Does not Hezekiah persuade you to give yourselves over to die by famine and by thirst? This Hezekiah, king of yours, you know, He's, he's encouraging a man to die. He's encouraging you to die by famine and by thirst. Of course, he doesn't know that Hezekiah has diverted the spring into the city. They may get hungry, but they're not going to get thirsty. They've got plenty of water. Saying that Yahweh our God shall deliver us out of the hand of the king of Assyria. You know, don't kid yourself. Who do you think Hezekiah is? Hath not this same Hezekiah taken away his high places and his alders and commanded Judah uh, to worship uh, and Jerusalem, saying, Ye shall worship before one altar and burn incense upon it? That shows how little he knew about the God of Hezekiah. Uh, for Hezekiah was only commanding the, uh, fulfilling the commands of God to destroy the high places and the, the other places of worship and bring the central worship right into Jerusalem. Uh, it's interesting how that people talk about uh, our faith who know nothing about our faith. I'm amazed at what some supposedly knowledgeable people say about the Bible. How totally ignorant they are of the Bible and yet they talk like they're authorities. 
we had a debate here one night and we had some professors from Cal State Fullerton who were debating against Dr. Morris and Dr. Gish and this one professor of Cal State uh, was talking about Eve in the garden and he said and the people said she ate an apple he said that's so funny because in the Hebrew it's pomegranate well in the Hebrew it's nothing it's just fruit and it doesn't say what kind it is and he turned out to be the fruit you know <laughs> but I mean that's the way people are they talk so knowledgeably like you know you know, and pompously about the Bible and they really know nothing about the Bible. Shennacherib says, you know, he, he had you break down the high places and all and uh, to worship, you know, this Yahweh and just said, offer the incense. Well, that was God's command. He didn't know it. Don't you know what I and my fathers have done to all of the people in the other lands? Don't you know what Assyria is doing? Were the gods of those nations and those lands in any way able to deliver their lands out of my hand? Notice the I, the mys, and so forth. Who was there among all of the gods of the nations that my fathers utterly destroyed that could deliver his people out of my hand that your God should be able to deliver you out of my hand? The whole idea was to destroy faith, to inspire fear, and Satan so often uses the same guise today against us. He tries to plant fear in your heart and destroy your confidence and faith in God by getting you to look at the circumstances, getting you to look at the problem, the power of the enemy. And if you get your eyes on the enemy, now what Hezekiah was doing was focusing the people's eyes upon the Lord. All they've got is the arm of flesh. With us is Yahweh our God. You know, get your eyes on the Lord. He will fight this battle for us. Now, Shnechereb's trying to get their eyes on him. The power of his army. Now therefore, don't let Hezekiah deceive you or persuade you on this manner. Neither yet believe him. For no God of any nation or kingdom was able to deliver his people out of my hand and out of the hand of my fathers. And how much less he is deprecating now, the God of Israel. How much less shall your God deliver you out of my hand? And his servants spoke yet more against Yahweh, the God of and against his servant Hezekiah. Uh, in 1 Kings, uh, it gives uh, quite a bit of the, the blasphemous speech of the Rabeksha against the Lord. He also wrote letters in which he threatened Hezekiah and threatened the people and uh, spoke against Jehovah God. So he wrote letters to rail on Yahweh, the God of Israel, and to speak against him, saying, As the gods of the nations and the other lands have not delivered their people out of my hand, so shall not the God of Hezekiah deliver his people out of my hand. And the guys outside cried to the people on the walls in loud voices in the Hebrew language, and, and that seeking to frighten them and to trouble them in order that they might take the city. So it was a whole psychological warfare going on here as these guys were calling up the threats, telling the people on the walls of what they were going to do to them, how they were going to mutilate them, and all that they dared to resist and uh, seeking actually to get them to capitulate. And they spoke against the God of Jerusalem as against the gods of the people of the earth, which were the works or the work of the hands of men. They talked about God as though he were like the other gods. Gods that were created by men's hands. Little idols and so forth. They didn't know who they were contending with. Hezekiah took the letter in before the Lord. And he, put, he stretched the letter out before the Lord. And he said, Lord, look how they're blaspheming you. Look what they're saying. And Lord, it is true. We don't have the strength to go against this army. They, they, they're stronger than we are, but Lord, 
They're not stronger than you. So we're going to trust in you. We're going to rely on you. Take care of them, Lord, because look what they said. So for this cause, Hezekiah the king and the prophet Isaiah, this, of course, is the prophet Isaiah who has written the book of Isaiah, and he gives us extra details on Hezekiah and upon this period of time. In fact, um, Hezekiah, t I mean, Isaiah tells us at, at this period that when God wiped out the Assyrian army, that a great fear gripped the hearts of the sinners in Jerusalem. When they saw the power of God against the Assyrians, they said, wait a minute, this is a pretty powerful God. Who are we to stand before him, you know, without getting wiped out? Who, who of us can approach this fire without being destroyed? So Isaiah and Hezekiah prayed and they cried to heaven. And the Lord sent an angel which cut off all the mighty men of valor with the leaders and the captains in the camp of the king of the Syria. In one night, 185,000 were slain by the angel of the Lord. Died mysteriously in the night. So that when the rest of the troops awoke and looked around, they were surrounded by these dead corpses of their, of their brethren. So the king returned with shame of face to his own land. And when he was coming to the house of his God, he had been, you know boasting about they that came forth out of his own bowels slew him there his two sons actually assassinated their dad with a sword and then they fled themselves to Armenia according to history thus the Lord saved Hezekiah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem from the hand of Shnechereb the king of Assyria and from the hand of all others and guided them on every side God delivered them out of the hands of the Assyrians. The Assyrians, because of the weakened position, soon fell to the Babylonians. This, was the, this broke the back of the Assyrian power. There had been this constant uh, fighting between the Babylonians and the Assyrians for, for strength and power. And the Assyrians had the upper hand until God destroyed these forces. And then Babylon immediately took the upper hand and Assyria no longer was a world-dominating power, but a Babylon uh, rose to this. And of course, Assyria was just north of Babylon and thus they had greater conflicts uh, with each other than with other nations. So in those days, well, thus the Lord saved Hezekiah, guided him on every side, and many brought gifts unto Yahweh to Jerusalem and they brought presents to Hezekiah, the king of Judah, so that he was magnified in the sight of all of the nations from then on. They, all of the nations say, wow, Hezekiah wiped out the Assyrians, you know. And in those days, Hezekiah was sick to the death. He was deathly sick. And he prayed unto Yahweh, and he spake unto him, and gave him a sign. The Lord spoke to him, gave him a sign. But Hezekiah was healed. God gave him an extra 10 years uh, or so, a little bit more. Uh, but Hezekiah, in, in the healing, and, and we'll deal with this when we get to, uh, uh, well, we'll get next week when we deal with Manasseh. We'll deal with uh, Hezekiah's recovering from this sickness. Um, in Isaiah, he describes his prayer, how he uh, mourned like a dove all night long. He, he, he chattered, and, and he, was, he was probably, you know, had chills and was chattering and, and mourning like a dove, and yet God healed him and extended his life. Uh, 14 years, but it was, it was not good. But Hezekiah rendered not again after this. He did not render according to the benefit that was done to him. For his heart was lifted up. Therefore was wrath upon him and upon Judah and Jerusalem. After this he became proudful. It's sort of tragic after God has done such a spectacular work in a man's life. That the man sort of gets lifted up. And that is the danger always. We see it today. We see it today demonstrated in the ministries where God will bless a man's ministry. And the man gets lifted up with pride. And uh, how God then brings them down. 
But you begin to think, well, it's my ability or it's my personality or it's my, you know, and, and so with Hezekiah, you know, I've got this power with God. I, you know, I, and boy, I'll tell you bad news. So he did not render to the Lord according to the things that God had done. He was lifted up with pride. And when God then began to uh, deal with him, he humbled himself for the pride of his heart. He did respond, which is good, uh, unto God. He and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that the wrath of the Lord did not come upon them in the days of Hezekiah. Now he was exceedingly wealthy. And he had a lot of honor. He made for himself treasuries for the silver and for the gold and for the precious stones and for the spices and for the shields and for all manner of pleasant jewels. He had storehouses also for the uh, corn and the wine and the oil. And then he had these stalls for all manner of beasts and coats for flocks. Uh, the, these, the, remember, David said, you took me out of the sheep coat. A coat is, is a uh, enclosure, a stall for the sheep. And so he had these stalls for the, it's called coats. We don't think of that word today, but it's uh, stalls. Moreover, he provided him cities and possessions of flocks, herds in abundance, for God had given him a great amount of substance. This same Hezekiah also stopped the upper water course of Gehon, and we've talked about this already. He brought it straight down to the west side of the city of David, and Hezekiah prospered in all his works. How be it? In the business of the ambassadors of the princes of Babylon, who sent unto him to inquire of the wonder that was done in the land, God left him to try him that he might know all that was in his heart. There came, after the Assyrians were wiped out, the Babylonians were so happy, they sent emissaries to him to congratulate him, you know, on, on the recovery. Then he was sick unto death and he was healed. And so they sent these emissaries to say, oh, you know, great guy, you know, wonderful. And so in his pride, he began to show off the wealth. Took him in, showed him all his, you know, jewels, all the gold, all the silver and all. And, and the prophet came to him and said, who were these guys that came that were just leaving? He said, they were the Babylonians. He said, what did you show them? He said, I showed them everything. He said, you have planted the seeds of disaster. They have seen the wealth and now greed will fill their heart. They'll go back and they'll talk about it. And soon the Babylonian army will be down here to rip off this wealth. And of course, it did happen. But it was sort of a prideful thing. I'm going to show off how wealthy I am. Uh, and um, pride cometh before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. So uh, it was a testing of God he failed. Now the rest of the acts of Hezekiah, his goodness, behold, they're written in the vision of Isaiah. And we'll get it when we get to the book of Isaiah, the prophet, the son of Amos. And in the book of the kings of Judah and Israel, which we've already covered. And Hezekiah slept with his fathers. They buried him in the chiefest of the sepulchres. Good king, got a good burial in the chiefest of the sepulchres of the sons of David. And all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem did honor him at his death, and Manasseh, his son, reigned in his stead. Interesting thing now. His father was a horrible king, a wicked king. He basically was a good king. His son Manasseh was horrible. Interesting. Just flip-flop. Uh, from a bad king to a good king, now to a horrible king, and then we'll come back to a good king again, Josiah. So uh, it's a period of, uh, of real uh, yo-yoing, really, for the nation as far as the leadership is concerned. It was the purpose of Hezekiah to basically get the people to focus their eyes not upon the problem, not upon the enemy, but upon the Lord. This is what dispels the fears. This is what takes away the anxiety. 
This is what gives you strength and courage as you look to the power of the Lord. If God be for us, who can be against us? The glorious truth is this. God is for you if you will be for him. And if you seek him, you'll find him. But if you forsake him, he'll forsake you. May this be a week of our seeking God. May the Holy Spirit focus our attention upon the power of the Lord, his ability to take care of whatever problem you are facing. So with your eyes focused upon him, we will go forth and see God do battle for his people. We'll see the Lord close the mouth of the enemies. We will see God triumph as we place our trust and confidence in him. God bless you. Give you a beautiful week as you serve our Lord.